So Toby, thanks, thanks for your time, mate. I think we've known each other for quite a while now. And I think people are going to be really interested in hearing about your career, how it's progressed, and then also what you do today at Citrix. Um, so as a starting point, you can just introduce yourself and give us a view of what you do now. Okay, uh, thanks for having me. Okay, um, so um, I am a sales engineer at Citrix. Um, I've been with Citrix five years. Uh, essentially what that is, is I provide technical pre-sales assistance to the sales team within Citrix. Um, predominantly the sort of field sales sellers or the, mid, the mid-market sellers, but I have been involved in other accounts as well. I've been across, involved in accounts across EMEA and public sector accounts. So it's, 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 Citrix is one of those organizations where if you throw your hand up, then you, you'll get, you know, sort of asked to, to, to help out uh, in other accounts. But as part, I have a secondary role as well, and that role is working with the, the Microsoft Alliances team. So I do a lot of work across EMEA, talking and promoting Citrix and Microsoft partnership. Uh, and what that sort of, over the last couple of years, that's meant I've become the sort of go-to guy for all questions around uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. So two, two, two different aspects of the role, sales engineer for Scotland, but also the sort of Microsoft SME across EMEA as well. Oh, nice. Perfect. And so where, so where did your career start out and how has it progressed over the years? Oh, where did it start? Oh, God. Uh, 1997. Um, so I think probably the easiest way is to go back in time a little bit. So um, I think when I was at school, it was, you know, careers advice. What do you want to do? Um, and I always thought, well, what do I enjoy doing? And I had a Commodore 64 in the house. So and I used to play games on that, but I also used to program on it as well. So after that, careers advice, I just did anything that had a computing focus at school. I did it. Um, and anything... Then that led to college, that led to university, and that ultimately led me to working in the co-op um, in, the, in the frozen food section for a couple of years. Um, and then uh, I decided that it was time to find that, you know, an IT job as such. And I, and I, I think I remember I wrote away to, you know, this is 1997, so, you know, there wasn't even, you know, I didn't even, I don't even think I had proper email or anything at that point, so... I remember writing a proper letter and mail merging it and sending it out to every single organization I could find um, in, in the sort of Glasgow area. And I got two responses, one of them, no thanks. And the other one was, why didn't you come for an interview? Um, and that was a company called HarperCollins, the book publishers. And I got a help desk role there. Um, you know, very junior, very entry level. Um, but it, it, it kind of served me well and that became permanent and that that's you know that's where I sort of I started at the bottom and worked my way all up to the top and left like 11 years later as the the infrastructure manager so always um I always look back fondly in that time and I, I remember it well and I think it served me well in terms of building up skills and you know yeah, I was out swapping floppy hard yeah, floppy disk drives and hard drives and reinstalling Windows 3.1, you know, that became NT4, Windows 2000, XP. So it was a real good kind of, um, you know, learning experience and learning curve. Um, and I think that served me well for, for where I am now, so. Yeah, it's been quite common against a lot of the people that we've been having these conversations with that a lot of guys have started out in that first line support style role. Yes. Learning the tools of the trade, understanding issues from customers or from, from the end users, right? And then, then progressing their career into more and more technical roles as time's gone by to then potentially leading teams and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I still, I still, I mean, the pin number I had to log into my help desk phone is still my pin number from my, my phone now. So it's <laughs> it's ingrained and I, I still find myself typing in the domain name sometimes. So I'm logging into my test machines and I'm typing in like the old uh, NT4 domain name. So you, you can tell it's sort of that, that built, you know, that, that knowledge goes in and, and doesn't, doesn't drift away, you know, Firewall, Knowledge, Exchange, Citrix, NT4, it's all still in there somewhere, so. Yeah, and you've done a bit of a chopping and changing over that time, right? So you were, you were with those guys, and then I think when I remember when I was speaking to yourself, you were at AppSense for a while, I think it was, and then a few other bits and bobs, so it's like, yeah, it's been a bit chopping and changing yeah. over the years. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I did the sort of, so I did, I did the, the apprenticeship through, you know, left as infrastructure manager, and actually, left once you know hand in my notes once and, and and then sort of get talked around by the the company so you know i've learned that that's never always the, the the best thing to do but eventually i sort of decided that i wanted to take what i knew 
uh, and and actually put that into practice. So you know, I joined a, an organisation in Scotland, a consultancy organisation, and then all I did was Citrix, VMware, and Microsoft. Uh, I did that for a number of years. Got an, a real good idea for how to talk to customers and the pre-sales process, the post-sales process, everything like that. And then I actually met I went to an event at IBM one day um, and they showed me this black magic and it was called AppSense. And I looked at it, I thought, I did not understand how that works. And I think a year later, yeah, I got a call from an agency saying, look, they're looking for somebody in Scotland. Um, would you like to... Would you like to try out for it? And I said, sure. And I said, well, they want you to present on present about the, the product or do a demo of it. So I obviously picked the, the worst case scenario and learned the product and live demoed it to somebody, you, I think it was Simon Townsend um, at the time. So uh, demoed it there. And then about a month later, I'm on site at one of the biggest projects, the biggest VDI projects in Europe at the time, delivering AppSense, a product I'd only just, <laughs> I'd, I'd only just gained awareness about. Um, I think I handed my notice in after about three months. <laughs> um, and then he said, Tony, what, is it, what, what was wrong? I said, I just, I'm, I'm absolutely stressed to the max in this job. And I don't, you know, I didn't feel I had the support at the time, but they actually changed that for me and they gave me the support. And I, I stayed 14 months and delivered that project. Um, and that gave me a real good basis for everything enterprise, everything financial services and, you know the contractors as well because it, it was full contractors working on that project as well how to interact with them the, their priorities etc so one of the best experiences of my life but for a while one of the worst experiences in my life learning learning a product at that kind of scale is you know and learning the challenges with it is never a good idea so yeah definitely and i think um, and then from then you did a bit of consulting right and run your own business for a little while and then you, you joined citrix yeah i think um god yeah i, I, I had another the, the, the work the, the absence but there wasn't after after that big engagement finished there wasn't a lot of um scottish focus work so i ended up um getting tapped up for a couple of roles and and went to work for a set up an end user practice and in, in another uh, in another partner base that leads that that actually ended in um, in redundancy unfortunately because they just never they never got the traction they needed i think i think that's when that might be just after that, i think i met you kyle because yeah. uh, you were working at a partner i interviewed for them um but ultimately i i got a kind of the contractor bug at that point so yeah. because i worked with so many people um when i was at absence that were working um for fujitsu that time and were contractors i thought i quite like to try this so I ended up setting up on my own and um, did did uh, six months contracting. Um, I got I got a contract working in a, 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 a it's Camac Ferries down in uh, Gourock in Scotland. Doing they were moving to the cloud and they wanted infrastructure support, so I worked with them for six months and a real good time as well. But contractor lifestyle is a lot different than I thought it would be. You're basically just there as a resource. Do this, okay? Done that do this okay I need to put through a change request and it became it wasn't as enjoyable as I thought it was financially lucrative but it, it wasn't as enjoyable as I thought it would be in terms of the work so I think at that point I decided that I, it, back to Permiland I went and I, <laughs> and I think it ended up at SCC uh, I think for um, 12 months before the Citrix came calling and that's that was just an opportunity too good to too good to 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 say no to so yeah, what, what, what's it like transitioning from the, the reseller world to the to the vendor space, right? I, I mean, obviously, I was in vendor space. Absence, okay, it was professional services, and, and now it's pre-sales. But um, I found it I found it relatively easy. I think as because I think I was getting less and less technical. I wasn't so bothered about being that guy in the data center at midnight, you know, with his head in his hands trying to figure out why this isn't working is it a vlan tagging issue or something like that so i much more enjoyed talking to customers and and seeing like you know helping them make the decisions and solve business challenges for them so i'd already kind of i suppose prepped myself for that and i was ready for you know that was what i enjoyed that was what i was doing so when i joined citrix it was just like okay right so i get to talk about the technology still get to play with it 
but I don't actually have to do it unless it's a POC. Um, and even then, you know, we, we try and shy away from POCs, you know, wherever possible because you want to sell, you know, you want to sell the vision, the belief, the strategy. You want to sit, you want to do all that. You don't actually want to feel that you have to deploy it to, um, you know, to actually see what the deal is such. So for me, I actually found it relatively easy. Um, but I then, you know, the opportunity to work for Citrix at that point was just, they were, you know, if it was Citrix, Microsoft and VMware, any of those three were so instrumental in shaping my career that, you know, I probably would have taken, I probably worked for free, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, for, just for the chance, so. Ah, good stuff. And what would you say is the most memorable moment in your career? Well, I mean, the absence time was, you know, was stressful, was, was fun, was fun, you know, there was nerf battles and things like that, that with <laughs> people like Kev Howell, I'll call him out in this one, where we used to have nerf battles at lunchtime. And I mean, it's, it's hard, it's hard to, you know, you know, I, cause I really enjoyed the last, you know, three years within Citrix cause I've been doing all the, all the, the Microsoft uh, SME work as well and been to Dublin and presenting all over the place and at WVD events and things like that. So it, it, it's hard, but I would say it is a, as a, as a, you know, as a point in my career, the, the, the absence days and, and that project from where I went into where I left and, and, the, and, the, and, you know, the sort of feedback that I got from the CTO um, at the time on how we were instrumental in, in delivering that and how I was instrumental in it was quite, um, was quite, was quite something that um, was quite something I look back for anyway, so. Yeah, and what is the, the biggest mistake that you made and the lesson you learned from it? Uh, <laughs> biggest mistake? Well, uh, I've made a lot of um, technical mistakes. Um, and one where I went off on holiday for a couple of weeks and, and came back to quite a lot of heat because <laughs> uh, I had updated a print server to uh, something, uh, server 2003, and it should have been server 2000 because I thought, no, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But... I think you know remembering that you live within project boundaries and there's reasons why people are taking making decisions around um designs etc and you can't just be a bit maverick and just go do what you want because you believe it's something better so i've been pegged back a few times like that but yeah def definitely career advice i would say if you've made up your mind and you're, you're moving the grass isn't you know the grass isn't always greener but you'll never know until you find out so having resisted going and being swayed back by an organization uh, I would say always always think about that think about your reasons for leaving and the frustrations or challenges because it tends to be that organizations don't don't deliver what they promised luckily absence they did for me you know they did actually help me out and listen to my concerns and, and and made it work for me but other times not so much so yeah, I think it's a common thing. So I was um, talking to Tim Kazmage the other night, who's an IT recruiter, right? Um, and that, 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 I never remember the statistic, but it's basically if, if you've managed to secure a job elsewhere and then use that contract and got more money where you were, so you don't end up moving, within 12 months, you're looking at leaving again generally because the, yeah. there was something underlying than the money that was the problem. Yeah. Um, but then, and then it's great just, for recruitment it, agents, right? <laughs> And it's just having the comp. I mean, because nothing, nothing strikes fear into the heart any more than I really want to leave this organisation. Oh, now I've got my chance. Oh, right, okay. Now that, and then you start questioning, do I do I really want to leave? You know, you know. So I think it's it's you know it's just always that that sort of nervousness about about the move and imposter syndrome. You know, am I going to be able to you know cut it? Because you know every day I wake up and think when I'm meeting a customer going do I actually know this you know why am I on this call you know you know I'm a fraud you know everyone feels that <laughs> um and sometimes sometimes you do get that sort of maybe if I just stay and you know and maybe they gave me a couple you know a couple of extra grand you know that might make things better but as you say you're right there's there's always something underlying that says you, you don't want to be here or you you need to progress or you need to move on as well so Definitely. And so, so why, why why did you get into the industry then? Just for the love of tech, or? Uh, well, I think I'm going back to my, you know, what I, what I spoke about earlier on that. Um, you know, Dad gave me a Commodore 64, and I thought, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel it was before your time, Kyle. But you know, you put in a tape and press play, and then you wait, you know, 12 minutes for a game to load. So, 
And I spent a lot of time going, well, what else can this thing do? Because this isn't something I want to go. So it was just, you know, programming. I mean, I, I, if I probably got my way, I would have been a programmer because that was what I, I qualified in. That was what I was good at. I could write, you know, I could write Turbo, what was it? Turbo Pascal, I think, was the mm -hmm. programming language at the time, you know. But I never quite got that opportunity to to move into that role. In fact, I did have one interview at it. Uh, I, I didn't manage to secure it. So I was kind of forced into the you know infrastructure world and then you think, well, I'm learning this, you know, Windows. But I, I think I think Microsoft is, is to blame for a lot of it because, you know, you're using it in the house, you're using it at work, you know, you hit the problem, you've got to solve a challenge with it in the house, you've got to solve a challenge with it you know, uh, in work as well. And I think that just ended up shaping everything I did. And then I certified in 94 and Windows 2000. Before I knew it, I, I, I really enjoyed it as well. And people would come to you and think, well, you know this, you know, you help us out. And, you know, that that's where the reward comes, fixing the problems or building the solutions that, that, that solve the challenges. So, uh, and I think, candidly, I think that's what I still enjoy is, what I, what I call the penny drop when the customer gets it, you know, and that's 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 almost like building a technical solution. It's like, well, if you can, you can make the penny drop in their head uh, and convince them with my language and my passion, then that's what makes makes me gets me excited and, and makes me get up in the morning as well. So, oh, good. And do you reckon you made any sacrifices along the way? Yep, I think. I think work-life balance for me and from probably the year 2000 to the year 2012 was non-existent. Yeah. Uh, and I, but I think a lot of that was my own, my own making because I would say I would, you know, I don't play golf or anything like that. I, you know, I don't have hobbies of that, you know, that take up time. So I would spend nights, probably like you, on sitting on the sofa with a a laptop with 32 gig in it, building vSphere environments to see what would happen, you know, to the detriment of everything else that went along. Um, I think luckily enough, I realized that when my, my kids were born and I kind of, it took a back seat at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't learn any other skills or, <laughs> or build up a, a, a sports repertoire, put in lots of weight as well at the time. So, you know, I think I just got so, you know, to me, the only thing I could do was, you know, work, um, you know, I was getting calls out of hours all the time as well. I was the, the you know, the person to fix the exchange server problem, you know, but I actually thrived on it, I think, a little bit. But I think, you know, now not so much. I, I don't, I don't tend to try and let work, you know, affect me too much in those important times with family because I don't, I don't get, you know, I don't get this time back with them. So I think making sure it's as quality as, as possible is, is paramount for me at the moment. So. Yeah, and I think, a lot of people have been in those support roles, right? Where you've got the demands, the pressure, the people shouting down the phone scenario and things going wrong and all that. And I think, I think it does become a bit of a drug, right? A bit of a kind of thing that you get used to, right? Which is, well, I'm, I'm thriving under pressure. I'm doing well. And there's no pressure there. You might take your foot off the gas a little bit just to get that pressure to then accelerate yeah. you through it. I, I, I remember, I remember a four day network outage, um, you know, where we were just living on pizza and shifts. But, you know, it's something you look back on and you go, you know, you've got that. Do you remember when we did it? Do you remember how we, you know, how we got around it and how we solved those problems and, and how everyone pulled together? And I think you're right, adrenaline, you know, love and pattern. It, that, it, it never has felt like a job to me, what I do. It just feels like, you know, so, you know, so what, you know, I don't naturally drift too much between mm. this is eight o'clock is start, nine o'clock, you know, yeah. five o'clock is finished. It's just... I enjoy it, you know, I enjoy, you know, things like this as well, you know, you know, talking about my experiences as well. So I don't think it's ever, unless it's like the, the six o'clock, I've got to travel, you know, get up for a yeah. flight or whatever. I remember those days. Um, <laughs> or get in the car and drive to Aberdeen for, for a one hour customer meeting. I think at that point you think well, it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel fun, but the rest of the time, I think it, it never does feel like a, a truly like a, a, a job. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed for that, I think, so. Yeah, and if you're looking back at yourself over the years when you've been been in these positions, what, what top three tips would you give yourself with hindsight? Um, I would think always, you know, 
always be just be conscious that when you're talking to somebody that everyone's got their own battles and challenges and dealing with different things you know you know and never never to react too much to things you know if you get you know, have a conversation with somebody puts you down or you think they're not helping out then you know maybe try and understand why um because i know it's certainly when i've been under stress i've not reacted well and then had to go and apologize or whatever so i do spend a lot of time with people going you know just don't send the email you know don't don't hit the Slack button, don't hit Teams, whatever. why don't you pick up the phone, phone up somebody, see how they are, you know, don't start with the problem, ask them how they are and, and, and what's happening, especially in these times, Kyle, as you know, it's just everyone's stuck with the same backdrop, yeah. <laughs> Teams calls all the time, you know, you know he's still sitting in the, he's in the same room, yeah, still the same room, so there's a lot that we're all facing, um, and I was one early on in my career for writing emails, you know, everything, document, whatever, spend hours documenting emails and sending them and then just sitting watching, waiting for the reply and never was very good at picking up the phone. And I think later on in my life, I realized that certainly in sales, it's, you know, pick up the phone, phone your colleagues, phone your customers, et cetera. Um, listen to advice. I've had lots of good mentors, um, you know, in my career, you know, including the guy that gave me my first chance in IT, various other people that I put their arm around you, the person who used to proofread all my emails before they went out, you know, that helped me with constructing them, all those kind of things and pay it forward. I mean, I, I, you're probably, you're probably hearing that a lot, but if you can, you know, take somebody under your wing, you know, you don't have to manage them, but if you can mentor them or help them or develop them, you know, I find, I definitely think if you do that, then if you've had that reward, then you pay it forward and, and they will pay it forward for you as well. So you know, take that, take that time out of your day just to, you know, speak to that colleague that's maybe not, maybe, maybe struggling or whatever to understand and, and help them along rather than just saying, oh, he, you know, he's rubbish or whatever, why do we hire him, you know, you know, take that time because everyone, everyone's a human being, my word, so. Yeah, definitely. I think people are too easy to judge and to, too easy to just, just leave people to suffer on their own, right? So I think yeah. giving them a helping hand is, is always a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we switched to industry, right? So um, obviously a lot's changed since since 1997. Um, what would you say the biggest change is, the biggest impact? Uh, you know, well, I'm, it depends. There's, there's, there's tech, tech, technological shifts. So we had like server virtualization and Office 365. You know, there's, there's, there's all these things that have happened that have been shifts in the industry and, and forced people to change skills, etc. Obviously public cloud is... I think we're still at the beginning of this journey, but I had this, I had a guy I used to work with at HarperCollins, um, Alistair, and he was a bit of a sort of really old school, but he goes, I've seen it all before. It was distributed and then it was centralized and then it went out and then it went, it's just new names for everything, you know, uh, edge computing, et cetera. So it, it, it does feel like the same kind of cyclical sort of trends that go on. So. You know, I think if you sort of analyze anything that's happened, um, you know, in the last 30 years, you probably would have seen it a couple of times in, in a similar kind of shape and form because nothing sits still. I mean, I'm still still talking to you on a Windows device, yeah. you know, uh, a Windows 10 device. Um, you know, I started on a Windows 3.1 device. You know, I maybe don't have a floppy disk drive, <laughs> but I've still got a USB. You know, I can still put a USB stick in it or I, you know, you know, if I want to, you know, if I want to watch a funny clip that's not like emailed round, it's like streamed from the internet. And, you know, it's the same, it's the same structures and same patterns, just different ways of, of delivering it a lot. So yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't really say, you know, I, I think it's certainly in terms of technology, you know, what Microsoft have done, you know, the way they've transformed for, you know, service, del you know, delivering things as a service and, you know, their whole change from, it's Microsoft to more open source and, you know, service driven, you know, revenue driven and what VMware did and, and what Citrix did for, for virtualization and, and remote working, obviously in the last, I think we've, you know, we've seen a, a tremendous acceleration just in the last six months of, of businesses and their home working, remote working strategies, et cetera. I, I would probably think that's probably the most, the largest change that I've seen is just what's happened when human humans have been forced forced to mm. change the patterns you know yeah you've been doing three whatever. years of transformation right in six months so. yeah yeah you know and, and it wasn't for the the reasons that anyone thought there would be it was a 
a global pa a pandemic where business continuity plans, people are reading them going, no, <laughs> there's nothing that covers that in there. So just get yeah. rid of it. So let's just, um, you know, let's send people home with desktops and laptops and, you know, VPNs yeah. collapsing everywhere. So it's it's been, you know, I would say I've never seen a, a sort of a shift in mindset that we've seen in this last, what, nine months or such so yeah if you think we we pick on the pandemic right because it's, it's on everyone's mind in some way shape or form um what do you say the the, the positive one positive and one negative that's going to come out of the back of this negative is obviously uh, you know there'll be a lot of interaction like this so you know a lot of you know teams calls and calls etc and they're not they're not they're just not the same as much as the as much as it's great you know to, to not be there and be able to have coffee or or whatever needs to you know there will need to be this blended approach definitely moving forward i mean i've always worked from home but at some point you just need to get out and, yeah. and actually meet a human being face to face um rather than sitting you know sitting in these calls which is really tough doing them all day because you feel like you're got to be you know in, in a traditional environment you'd be in for a customer meeting for an hour back out debrief maybe another one in the afternoon whereas now we're going hour after hour after hour after hour you know looking at each other and and having to you know all this cognitive load that, that, that's mm. been put on so i think that has to be addressed but i think the good thing is you know all the all the inherent benefits of home working for people hopefully better work life balances for for the majority um you know obviously climate change, things like that. Citrix are very big on sustainability and mm -hmm. as are Microsoft as well. So hopefully we'll start to see real kind of, you know, I, ca I can't see us going and shipping 5,000 Citrix employees to, to America every year in the future when this is over. I don't think anyone, you know, Citrix is small conferences. You imagine Salesforce or any of those or even Microsoft, you know, these things, are, these things I can't see happening in the future as well. And that's got to have a good, you know, a good yeah. sort of, impact on the environment climate change all those things yeah definitely definitely okay so if we if we think about technology what, what's what's taking your interest at the moment technology wise from an enterprise it point of view um well i think i mean i think citrix are, are more relevant than ever at the moment so i think people have sort of focused on um our core you know our core strengths you know secure app desktop delivery I think that's now, I think the way that's morphing into, and I think everyone's going to have a, a solution that has a zero trust element to it as well, because getting corporate devices out to users wherever they are in the world now is going to be more of a headache. So, you know, if we can enable initiatives like BYO and use your own device, all those things as well, then you're going to need to have something that allows you to basically say, I don't trust this device at all, but here's a a full fidelity, high, you know, high security environment that you can, that you can um, be productive on. So, you know, I think that's going to become, you know, Citrix are, 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 you know, always have been, had a zero trust message, but I think that's now, you know, that's now going to come even more sort of prevalent um, as, you know, workspace solutions continue to develop um, and identity, things like that as well. So how do we handle identity? So we're not having to, you know, log into multiple platforms all the time, remember passwords. So, you know, things like the, the file keys and things like that, anything that can give you a really secure but simple experience to onboard quickly to an organization and to get work done quickly. And certainly I think that's a lot of the advances you see from Citrix, you know, with the workspace intelligence and, and all those things are all about getting people as productive and, and uh, as quickly as possible and as secure as possible as well. So I think those those solutions, and it's certainly looking at what VMware are doing now at the moment, some of their acquisitions, et cetera, it looks like everyone's kind of, you know, really kind of put the security hats on now and thinking, you know, security is going to be really, really, you know, as they as the attack vectors change, you know, you got to think that it's going to be easier to compromise somebody in the house than it is to do it behind the corporate firewall. So those attacks are going to get bigger so uh, and 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 cleverer we've certainly seen that in some of the, the phishing attacks that we've seen mm. even delivered at citrix employees as well so um, it's i think you know security i think it's probably going to be the the big thing for the next five years i think so 
Yeah, definitely. I think I've always had this mantra around what what what's kind of static, right? And things change, obviously, but what what's never really going to disappear. And from my selfish side of it, being a very workspace prominent person, is the end device or some kind of end device or connection method or the way you consume your desktop and applications, right? Basically, that kind of doesn't necessarily change too much. It might change, but it's not like you still need something to connect from. Yeah. You then your networks connect over and that's never going to go away, whether that's 5G, MPLS, VPN, whatever. It's it's still a connection required. And then the security wrap around the data center or the cloud services or your endpoints or the identities, the security, the network and the workspace for me are the three things that in every organization that will never disappear because they're the enablers and the securing methods of the services and platforms that you're delivering. Yeah. Um, and networks even more challenging again now that people have gone from, well, I'm in the office with a 100 gig connection to internet to I'm back home on you know, UK broadband, which... <laughs> which isn't great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've lost track of about team calls where it's like, oh, they've disappeared and, you know, people are just popping up, and, you know, so anything, you know, that people, that, that, that can happen in that, you know, network reliability and certainly that's an area such as playing with SD-WAN, but, you know, that's going to have to go from enterprise to commodity as well, so can we reliably take your internet link at home, your broadband connection and just add commodity 4G, 5G on, onto it and aggregate it all to give you a better connectivity experience than you would have had at the office as well. So those kind of solutions, but you're right, yeah, it's still workspace, network, you know, identity, you know, it's, it's all those things that are were just as important 10 years ago that are just as important now, so. Yeah, definitely. And if we... If we think about like unsung heroes of technology, right? So I use the example of things like Microsoft Flow or um, Power Toys that was shown to me by someone the other day, right? So I can create fancy zones on my, my ultra wide screen so I can actually snap things in the right locations and stuff. Do you think there's any any unsung heroes of technology that, that you use day to day or that people should be aware of? I mean, we use, I mean, it's used so much now. I mean, I think it's just you for the call. So let me just shut down some of the messaging tools that I've got. So that's Slack's off, what Teams is off, WhatsApp is off, et cetera. But I mean, we just live in this world where we're just so well connected to each other. Um, but it's the usual, you sort of end up with 20 tools and then somebody tries to make a tool to aggregate them all. And then we aggregate them all. And then somebody builds another tool and then we need another tool to aggregate all those. But, you know, there are blessings, sometimes a curse as well. But uh, yeah, I think certainly... You know, I would say Teams probably, you know, from as much as I'm I'm not the biggest fan of interface sometimes and it's quirks as a framework, as a platform to build upon. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, and I, I, see, I see Microsoft solving a lot of the problems. You know, every time I look, they've changed, there's something tweaked or whatever. But I, I do think they spend a lot of time on things that aren't as important, like some of the gallery views and things. But yeah. I think just in terms of... Um, of keeping teams connected and then it goes the same for zoom more you know uh, anything that your slack as well just these things that can keep you in close easy you know to communicate with your colleagues i've been a absolute godsend in, in, in these times because we accel citrix accelerated their teams roll out um i had it um before as part of my mix of sme role before covid but after covid hit then it just went now i have to deploy it and Every meeting we have now is on Teams. Um, it's very unusual, you know. Somebody sends a go to meeting link out, and it's like, even even then, go to go to. You know, we don't own it, but uh, it's still actually probably the second most reliable platform I've used. But uh, but yes, these these two for keeping us together in the days when we're all apart, I think have been have been the, probably the the unsung hero. So, and. Do you think there's any areas of enterprise IT that are undervalued and underinvested in? Undervested in probably, I mean, staff. I think sometimes, you know, these people that, you know, I go back to previous conversations about leaving organizations and and moving on, you know, it, it's always the same. It's, it's normally for the same reasons. So, you know, if you can invest in your staff and keep them skilled you know and some organizations do like Citrix are great you know but they, they have to hang on you know to top talent because otherwise it goes to the competitors etc but from a lot of the the organizations that I talk to as as customers it's you know it's the staff that feel like they get the the help desk technicians etc that you know 
IT is such, I don't want to say an enabler, but it, it's almost fundamentally, you know, you can't live without it, especially in this day and age. And it needs to be fed, it needs to be watered, it needs to be secured and patched. And if those guys on the ground that are doing that aren't being rewarded, you know, at the level they should, then, you know, they probably pose the biggest risk to a business moving forward now. Because if you begrudged, you know, if you're a, a firewall admin who's just mm. had enough and, you know, going back to, you know, working every hour, God sends, not, not, maybe not getting, you know, sort of rewarded by, by your management, then you make a mistake, you can compromise your that entire organization. So uh, again, re resources or sort of human resources are probably most undervalued, I think. So. Okay, it's a different out outtake than what people have been coming up with. Well, 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 what's been probably. the common theme then? The common theme is generally have just been, as always, productivity tool sets. There's been people that have mentioned VR and various other things, right? But the, I think the, the underlying thing for me for like this, this unsung hero to a degree, because I think um, one of the guys that I interviewed the other week said that the community was their unsung hero because they're the people that are yeah. helping where organizations just don't have the manpower to do so, right? And, and it's great that we can see that, that the people aspect is where we need time and effort ultimately. And that's where the biggest investment is needed because technology will change at a rapid pace of innovation yeah. right and unless those people are willing to uh, or invested in to do so as well it's, it's only going to fail and even even if you take it as a service right so if you take as a service offerings it still needs someone to look at it and go right does it conform to our security governance does it allow data sovereignty is it going to do this is it going to you still need that not necessarily maybe a, a deep level technical person like we used to have with people going into schemas and at the directory and all that kind of stuff but it's then more around the, the technical service delivery managers right so you're buying a new service how does it fit into the rest of the ecosystem yeah. i think that's the way that the it unless you're on the help desk right which is a bit different but the the third line roles right the pro, the infrastructure teams and organization that's where it's, it's changing right people yeah. are becoming more technical service delivery managers and i've spent the last four years talking about citrix cloud and how that can you know take away the pain of managing monitoring citrix you know take away all the bits that typically go wrong and delivery as a service and people say okay that means there's no job for me but you know again going back to i remember server virtualization coming in and people being worried that they weren't gonna have to manage physical tin things like that and office 365 taking away you know uh, exchange admin roles and things like that but everyone just moves up one level don't they it's just yeah. they move up to managing a, a level above where they maybe have before and they become different challenges governance you know security those aspects um but yeah um but going back to your community thing yeah obviously the communities you know is another has underpinned a lot of what's been happening in the world as well by pulling together the community had to change like the the azure user group and that sarah runs in scotland's all virtual now the neil's wvd virtual mm. uh, uh user group is all virtual now as well so people have had to adapt and change and yeah communities be a big a big uh, important part of that yeah and if we move on to like lightning round right so, so let's learn about a bit about toby what, what you're interested in and what you're not right so your last technology purchase <laughs> last tail well i make so many of them i'm i'm you know if if i would i would have bought the new apple iphone the other day but i'm waiting on the mac so i know <laughs> but then I'm, i've been questioning myself about that recently going do i actually need it I, i'm still on the series five apple watch and that's unusual for me as well it's normally new buy um but yeah i'm a i like i like gadgets um i like you know I, I, I like to I, I do a lot of ebaying a lot of buy it oh it wasn't as good as i thought and, and ebay it but i actually can't i can't remember I can't, to be honest. My, wife, <laughs> my wife was probably standing outside she probably shouted it was this it was that it cost x amount but... yeah it's either that you don't want to say it in case you misses watch the video and you get found <laughs> out <laughs> It's just, she doesn't know I'm doing it. She's, she's probably wondering what, what all the noise is at the moment. So, uh, but oh, I honestly, I can't remember. That's terrible. Uh, I mean, I've got like USB. -C, I've got tons of USB C dongles and things like that. But I actually can't remember what the last thing I bought was. But oh, I know what it was. I can't see it. It's up in the wall behind there. Um, uh, the Unify uh, Ubiquity networking. Oh, okay. So I went full on in that and bought the wireless access points and their uh, dream machine. And uh, I've configured, configured all that with a, 
with a guest wireless network with hotspot landing zone and stuff like that. Um, but that was that was just to solve some some you know how do I solve a black spots? Bl- bl- black spots. I mean the house isn't that big, but there was still elements of you would go places and switch to four G. So I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna fix that. Uh, so I'm probably going to uh, expand that as well with their uh, some of their switching as well, just to get a sort of a real view and all what's happening inside my networks. It's always always interesting to see. My man, where's, where's all that traffic coming from? <laughs> you realise you've just left something on a machine that you shouldn't have. So, uh, but yeah, that that was that was a substantial but a, a very enjoyable one as well because I then got to create site site VPNs into my Azure lab and things like that using that, and that that keeps the old noodle t- ticking along as well and how do I can figure a site site VPN again <laughs> what's, a, what's a pre-share key what's that for you know is it important should it be long should it be short it, it that all helps to keep it ticking over as well so perfect who would you say is your biggest inspiration who did you say or yeah who <laughs> I don't know if I can say on this um, <laughs> I've had a lot of a lot of people helped shape my career and you know, I, I'm not going to mention names, but there, there's people that have gone along, you know, through every role. I think every, I think in every position you're in, you'll always find somebody that's inspirational. In fact, I'll, I'll say in, in Citrix recently, it was a, a chap called Jeremy Hazeman, who's, who's, who's now left, but he he worked with me. He worked in the Microsoft relationship with me. He sort of pulled me along with him and just said, you know, just get in there and do it. Don't, you know, don't care what anyone says. If you think it's right, go and do it. And that that's given me a real kind of sense of of getting stuff done when perhaps the bureaucracy surrounding it maybe suggests you, sh- you shouldn't be going as fast. Um, but I think I've always had somebody that, uh, you know, in every role that I've been in that, that, that has shaped that for me and somehow and I'm still in contact with today, but yeah. I couldn't say what, I couldn't say one person. Oh, my wife. Yeah, my ch- my good answer. Good answer. And what hey, you just, hey, just to show that bit, where I just say my wife. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say work-life balance means to you? Probably when, I'd, I'd say the biggest example of it is when, you know, my door knocks here and it's my son comes in and he'll say something like, we play some Xbox or can we go out in the garden and kick a football about? Because I, I, I spit, you know, I coach him at football as well for, for his football team as well. And I think when I say no or I get angry, I go, no, I'm not got time at the moment. I, I think that's that's when it, it hits home to me because times like these are really important, um, you know, to be able to do that. And, and Citrix affords me that uh, capability to sit and say, okay, diary's clear for 15 minutes. And I've done this a lot where I've just taken, you know, Cam's coming from school. Mm three o'clock, uh, we've gone out in the back garden, we kicked the ball about 15 minutes, I've come up and then prep for a call or whatever. Uh, and for me, it's that. It's I don't want to regret something later on, say, I wish I'd just taken a bit extra time mm. then to see you know, them grow up or whatever, or to, you know, or I wish I'd taken the time to take them to that event or things, and I didn't, and I could have, uh, because ultimately this isn't important. Work, work's not important. It's the, it's, it is the family is the most important part of it. So, you know, work-life balance, finding the right balance for you is important, but yeah. certainly for me, and this time while the kids are still in the house, after yeah. they've left, <laughs> I, can go, I can go back into full meltdown mode and just, you know, <laughs> just throw myself into it. And I, I suspect I probably will. I think, you know, once, once that happens, there'll be time for a challenge that I know I can commit into and give a hundred percent to, because you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, not disappointing small children. So yeah. when I say small, yeah, <laughs> not exactly small, but you know. What I mean. <laughs> and what did you want to do when you finished school? I didn't know. Dream job. Yeah, you... Oh, dream job. Oh, I was um, centre forward for Rangers. <laughs> I, despite having no football ability whatsoever, I, I did think I would, you know, I could do no, I could, I could do an overhead kick and, you know, I try that now and I put my back out in the garden. Yeah. But yeah, you I mean. Would win over the weekend, right, as well. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to say anything about it, but yeah, we sort of put our <laughs> noisy neighbours in their place over the weekend. Um that might not help with the, <laughs> the views in the video. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did, that's what I wanted to do. And I think, I, you know, 
I, I, that's all I did when I was young. We just rolled apart and kicked football about. And I never, unfortunately, at that time, you didn't have grassroots football like you do now. But, yeah. you know, that capability to play for a team and be competitive. So, you know, I think hence right, going by the the career choice when I was getting it, what do you want to be a footballer? After that, what do you enjoy? Oh, I enjoy tippy tapping on a Commodore 64 and, and writing yeah. programs, you know, Hello World and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I think, but then my, that dream job would have been over, uh, what, 15 years now if I had been a footballer. So <laughs> I'd been having to find something else to do. Yeah. What would you say your favourite book is? I'm not big on books. That's the thing. Um, I, I do. I have Satya Nadella's Hit Refresh. I got three years ago and I'm still to open it. <laughs> But I bought it. Um, I've got <laughs> I, think, I think the thing is, right, when, when you're in the kind of roles that we're in, you do that much reading during the day that to pick up a book and then want to read something can sometimes be a little bit, yeah, I can't, I'll, I'll do that later. I'll be honest, mate. See, just with lockdown, um, you're, you're right. We do, we, you and I read a, a tremendous amount of blogs and we'll be bookmarking stuff for reading later and never getting around to it. So I've never tend to pick up a book and I always feel bad when I read these inspirational posts going this book changed my life and I I would say what was it was it the vSphere uh, was it uh, Duncan Epping's like uh, cluster deep dive book because that changed mine um you know things like that but you know I've actually taken to going back to you can see I'm obviously a big you know sort of Marvel and Star Wars fan uh, I've gone back and I'm reading comics again I'm reading you know digitally um you know actually just in bed just like that and I find that completely detaches me from anything just throws me back into this f- feeling like a kid again but no I'm, I'm not a big no, you know I don't read novels or anything like that or these power books or it used to be you know I've, I've probably got you know an IP6 manual down here <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and Baz Van Cam's uh, um, Citrix sort of bible book um, as they hit refresh but that's that's not um, not one for reading these sort of power books. Not, or not everyone yeah. is right. That's that's the key thing. So favorite song? Don't say the Proclaimers. Um, I was a big Prince fan. Um, you know, Prince was a big part of my growing up, and a lot. You know, there's a lot of songs from him that make me cry. You know, I hear the first few bars. Um, one called "She's Always in My Hair." Um, my wedding song, Forever in My Life, um, from Prince as well. Probably, whenever I hear that, that always makes me feel good. But again, probably not ones that people would know. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I, I, like, I like hardcore rap as well, so Eminem. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I like listening to Star Wars music. I mean, I'm, I just like what I like and whatever kind of, you know, sort of puts you back in a memory or gives you a memory. You know, Star Wars makes me think about when I was eight, nine, ten, things like that, when I hear that music. And memory, the music always just reminds you of points in your life. And Prince for me was like sort of growing up and meet my life and things like that. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, probably Eminem, I think is, is probably what, he's, he's what's on when I'm running in the morning. There's normally a, a, an Eminem playlist, so. Right, fill in the blank. The new normal is complex <laughs> no, um, <laughs> challenging um yeah challenging the new normal is challenging i think um you know obviously Citrix we help customers adapt to it no here's 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 a, here's another 500 licenses well, that's great is, is this what i need to do moving forward no let's talk to you about strategic you know your, your strategic transformation in terms of you know, where do you want to put those desktop workloads? You know, do you want to, you, what initiatives are important to you? Zero trust, things like that. There's a lot of these conversations that have to happen. And, you know, we need partners like like yourselves, et cetera, to help drive those because what is, where organizations are now is definitely not where they need to be to make best use of moving forward. So there's going to have to be this change from, the normal at the moment to the next normal or the new normal or whatever. I'm not a big fan of the phrases, but we need to help organizations adapt and, and be ready for this because as I say, there's the, the hackers and the bad actors are just gonna be sitting here like this at the moment going rich pickings, you know, people work from the house and unprotected Wi-Fi, all of those kind of things and uh, need to need to be holistically holistically, you know, solutions need to be holistic about, you know, and securing everything so 
And most watch TV show. Most watch TV show. Oh man, um, I'm. I've been watching the man. I like. I've rewatched the Mandalorian about three times. This new Star Wars one. I'm really looking forward to the the Marvel things. I I loved the X Files growing up. Um, what else? Shit's Creek is amazing. If you haven't watched Shit's Creek in lockdown, twenty five minute episodes, just so funny. My wife and I absolutely loved it. Um, but yeah, anything with kind of dramatic, dark sci-fi sort of tinge to it or anything that's associated with comedy. Oh, The Boys. Yeah. The Boys on Prime was immense, as was um, Umbrella Academy as well. Anything that's quirky and not necessarily true super, superhero, but dark side of superhero, I, I really like as well. So they were worth watching in sort of lockdown, so. Cool. And last question, favourite junk food? Favourite junk food? Oh, God. Um, I like Domino's pizza. I had one Saturday. I, was, I like McDonald's as well every now and then, but I went for a full medium pizza. The kids get two small ones. I got a medium one stuffed crust and added on some extras. So, yeah, I'd probably go Domino's. Awesome. Well, I think on that note, because I'm absolutely starving. So it's great to have your time, mate. Thank you very much for spending the last hour with me. You're welcome, Kyle. It's been very enjoyable, actually. I quite like that. So 